Hello and welcome to Inside the Teacher Studio. My name is Tisha Bender and I am an assistant director and instructor in the Rutgers Writing Program and I specialize in online and hybrid course teaching. Inside the Teacher Studio is a program where we interview teachers from around Rutgers University to learn more about the diverse classes offered here at Rutgers, the innovative teaching strategies used in different disciplines and class formats, and the overall process of becoming and growing as a teacher. This episode features Rutgers history professor Rudy Bell. Dr. Rudy Bell teaches several courses in the history department. He's also taking on one of the unique 21st century challenges to academics, the online class. I had the opportunity to hear about Dr. Bell's experience teaching online and hybrid courses and his ideas on how to lead stimulating online discussions. What made you want to become a teacher? Well, uh, I think I wanted, at least my mother probably is, who wanted me to become a teacher from when I was very little. So I think there's a, a photo, uh, I must be about seven, that says uh, the young professor looking at, <laughs> I guess her geography at that time, was sort of spinning a globe or some such thing. Oh, how sweet. And so and I've... She knew um, you were brilliant it, anyway. Uh, it's, not, it's not in the family. I, my oh. father was an electrician and uh, my mother was a, a stay-at-home uh, mm -hmm. mom. But um, I just always was very interested in it. So what drew you to the whole discipline of history? It's so far back that I can't say there was a specific moment. I don't think there was a specific teacher. I had some teachers as an undergraduate uh, that I still remember fondly. I mean, my PhD was in American history. My work uh, since the mid-1970s has all been in European history mm -hmm. and constantly drifting backwards. The Byrne Seminar that I teach is called Dying Divas, and it represents a um, passion of mine rather than an area of professional study. I'm not a musicologist. My interest is in introducing students to a world uh, that they may not be as familiar with. And in fact, um, the Dying Divas is about the male fascination with females who kill themselves or get killed by males and why that should be so prominent in the 19th century. You don't have it in Mozart at all, for example. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I assign the look at the liberator. I'm not sure everybody does, but it's all right. If they don't, I summarize for them how we got to the oh. point we get to. And we move from uh, the uh, Carmen image of an um, evil woman. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the jealous tenor is, is a, another trope ah. in, yeah. <laughs> in the opera. And so, right. so we, we deal with that. And it's just too many wonderful... Uh, stories to be able to to get them all. I mean, if I do like this time because we're going to see Butterfly, uh, that means I can't do Bohème and uh, yeah. or Tosca. So there's only Thank so you. many. <laughs> so well, it depends. Yeah, there's always a dying diva every yeah. spring to go to, to the Met. I mean, it's yeah. uh, it's still a very popular yeah. thing. And do you look at it from the sort of psychological point of view as well? Uh, as well, I did that much more fully when I did it as um, an honors seminar. Uh, but then my department wanted me to do other things more directly in the history department. That's when I came up with the Byrne Seminar. We don't really have uh, as much time as I'd like for the psychological aspects. Uh, and the students are very interested in performance issues. And since we go to the Met, which we're going uh, tomorrow evening, uh, performance matters. Now tell us about the other great course, or one of the other great courses, The History and the News. We take a news event every week. Yeah. We explore its historical background with both expert faculty who do videos and with written materials, which I cull from the internet. And we say, now if we knew all of this, would, are we better able to understand this event, which is unfolding right now? And it can be a nuclear disaster. It can be a Republican presidential primary. It can be same-sex a marriage in New Jersey. Do you want to talk a little bit, I know you've mentioned um, a small amount about how it's either a totally online course or it's a hybrid course. Would you like to say just a few words about how many are in each section and, and, and how you see, if you have a preference? We have uh, 150 students in five hybrid sections of 30 each. 
and 150 students in 15 online sections of 10 each. They all have the sa exact same presentation material. So every week we take the topic. We have the normally three guest experts who talk about it. I introduce it. Everybody has exactly the same readings. But the second half of each week, which is the discussion, is online for the onlineers and eye to eye for the people who do it that way. And students every week turn in both types turn in an op-ed, an opinion piece. It's like a letter to the editor, so it's fairly yeah. brief, a yeah. couple hundred words. And um, then they also are evaluated on their discussion, participation in the discussion. Uh, I think that the response from the hybrid students is more positive, and I think that is partly because students are more used to that, so that overwhelmingly their courses are that way. I find yes that students are remarkably inexperienced with a true all-online environment for discussion. Do you have any um, exciting future goals? You seem like such a resourceful person who's always coming up with extraordinary kinds of courses. Do you have anything in mind for the future? I'm very busy with this course and yes. it is still evolving and the biggest challenge it's within the course is how to build a little to keep its dynamism while also having some replication because constantly it's new topics exactly. and so suddenly preparing yourself for uh, revolutions in Kenya and nuclear yeah. disasters in uh, Japan is just extremely uh, difficult so that's a, a challenge I'd like to figure out how to make it a little bit more routine without losing its um, dynamic What do you do if you have to try and make a choice between two events which both seem very powerful? Well, uh, yeah, that I have resolved because where I can find my experts, my Rutgers people, and where quickly, and I do it mostly on the internet, I look at material that's interesting, that's the one I'm going to go with. Now, what do you do if you have a student who um, objects to the way an interviewer has presented some information? I think if you level with students, mm. And yeah. they know where your head is at and That's where you're nice. coming from. I think it. they can uh, deal more more openly with it. So, right. um, I, I mean, we we take on very controversial topics this week. Uh, coming up this coming week, we're going to do same-sex marriage. I have no doubt that among 300 students, I have some who, on religious or other grounds, strongly object to such. Uh, arrangements. Uh, they're going to see that that's not my position. I don't, I don't believe in that kind of objective neutrality. I'm the teacher. I do take a position, but I make it clear it's my position. You don't have to agree with my position. So within the discussion groups themselves, do you think that they have fairly heated discussions sometimes? Well, I don't want to call it monitor them, but I do look them over because otherwise how can I know how the course is going if I don't know yeah. what's going on? You know, otherwise exactly. I'm one end of a TV tube and it's... Yes nothing. So I do look them over and I, I'd say the positive has been that the students show great respect for each other. Right. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to see that. Uh, there is a, a thoughtfulness in response which you don't get in the hybrid groups when it's mm. live you know the moment passes and there's yeah. 30 other people and well, uh, this, this, yeah, this yeah. sits there and it's yeah. not always as responsive to each other as I'd like. That is people say their own thing but we're all not as good at listening as we are at talking. Do you define any expectations at the start of the course, t telling people that, that they all have their own right to their own point of view or their religious beliefs or whatever it happens to be, and that you want there to be kind of acceptance of different viewpoints? I think that there is a tendency um, to, for students to be too concerned with, so how do I get a perfect 10? on my op-ed or uh, how many times do I have to intervene in the discussion in order to get a 10 uh, rather than the more subtle issues that, uh, that we're talking about. Though on balance, um, I, it works out nicely. By the third, fourth, or fifth week, the students realize by the reality that in fact it isn't their opinion that they're graded on but the quality with which they express and back up that opinion. Now we begin the quick fire part of the program where professors answer a fun questionnaire. Professors respond with the first thing that comes to mind, letting us learn a little more about the person and his or her approach to teaching. What is your favorite word? Empathy. Sympathy has to do with uh, the, f 
feeling sorry for someone else. Empathy has to do with getting inside them and understanding their basic sensibility. How about your least favorite word or discipline specific term? Historiography. Um, historiography, which many people, in fact, I think uh, uh, word underlines it as an incorrect word. It puts mm. a red line under it, uh, which is what historians have said about history rather than history itself. Even though I'm a relativist, mm. uh, the study of historians arguing with each other over things does not interest me. What would you think is the most exciting time at the start of a semester? I love day one, which I call the big opener, because mm. that's when the students are still shopping. And it is my hope that they will shop wisely, not just because this is Tuesday, Thursday at 4.30, but if I can convey what's really going on and what's in my head mm -hmm. about what history means, then that's the successful day. Anything that's the least exciting part of the semester? Because I teach such big classes, my other patterns in Civ is 200 students, and I still use essays mm -hmm. on everything. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I can't communicate as thoroughly as I would want. What do you love to see in the classroom? When, when students get triggered mm -hmm. to actually discuss and I only need to be a facilitator, mm -hmm. that's the ideal. What do you hate to see in the classroom, if anything? I try to not look closely enough at students who are uh, texting. And what's your favorite excuse for lateness from a student? The, the one who told me that he was in a car accident and couldn't bring the, the paper in. And yeah, uh, well, I was hit in the rear. I said, you mean you put your, your, your paper where the engine is? You drive a Volkswagen. If you could study any other discipline other than your own, what might that be? Mathematics and music. Is there another discipline that you would not want to ever study? Sociology. And finally, if you could attend a master class taught by anyone else, whose class might you attend? A master class in opera, I attended one, and it was fa fabulous, really? absolutely fabulous. It's just one of the experiences of my life. Well, that indeed brings us to the end. So okay. many thanks, Rudy. Well, you're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you.